So I guess I will go ahead and start. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Marty Lang. I am, first of all and foremost, a husband of a wonderful woman. And I also have four great kids. And so that's what I do. That's my primary job. Now, my secondary job is that I work for SIL in the Americas area as the mobile technology coordinator for scripture engagement. Um, that's kind of a new title for me, and, I, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Now, so I came to this uh, from a completely different background, but I, I believe that it's, it, it, it works. Uh, I'll tell you my background. I've been a media guy with SIL since 1991. Uh, when I first came into the organization, I was one of the liaisons that worked with Campus Crusade. Uh, we got permission from them to dub the Jesus film. In fact, my first meeting with Crusade and, and my new boss, we sat down with the Crusade folks, and the first words out of Tom Denon's mouth were, Bill, we don't want to sue you guys. And uh, so that was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. <laughs> I have uh, done video dubbings. I have done audio recordings, audio projects, showed videos out in villages, and uh, most of all, trained others to do the same. To give you a little picture of that, um, we were in Peru for eight years, and while in Peru, um, uh, we were asked to go up to Wanaco, Peru, which is in the Central Highlands. And while we are there, they said, you've got six months to work with these people that we want you to train. I said, what, what do you want training in? And after we talked about some of the options, they said, we want you to train us in how to do audio, both uh, audio dramas and uh, radio programs. So we sat down the first day with, with, the, with the students that they gave me, and I said, um, let me play you something. And we play, they, I played for them an audio drama that one of my students had produced in Cusco just a, a year before with the sound effects and multi-voice and all that. And I said, in in six months before we leave, you folks will have produced not only an audio drama just like this, but it'll actually be better. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Quechuas, but they, they had been oppressed for 500 years, and they, they, they were like, they were looking at their feet, There's, they were going, you know what, this guy's nuts, there's no way that we're gonna be able to do that, but we'll sit and listen to him talk like this. And five months later, um, we sat down and we listened to the audio drama that they had just finished. It had 10 tracks, multiple voices, music, sound effects that they had recorded. And after it was finished, I said, well, guys, um, I want to play a little something for you. So I played a piece of the audio drama that I had played for them the first day that we sat down. And I said, whose audio drama is better? And they said, well, um, ours is. And so that's the kind of thing that I have, had been uh, doing before I got into mobile. Now, to follow on with that, um, one of the guys who was, who was part of the cast, they did, that, uh, they, they did the dramas in his language, and they did one that dealt with the misuse of money. And uh, talking about distribution, he got on a, on a public bus one day, and as they took off, the driver popped a CD in, and it was their drama of the misuse of money. And so he said, I better just shut up and not say anything because everybody in the van will recognize my voice. And so this, this drama dealt with the misuse of money, and it was very cultural, and it followed the track of how everybody had always done it. And what they do is they throw a big, once a year, somebody throws a big party for the patron saint of the village. And the bigger the party, the better the party, the happier the patron saint will be, and the more you will get blessed, is the, is the cultural concept. And uh, so they followed, they did a drama about this, and then the story behind it, and uh, at the end of the drama, um, he said, all of a sudden, everybody in the van erupted like, because in the drama, it doesn't work out that way. The guy ends up, he's thousands of dollars in debt, and his kids are poor and hungry and in rags, and, you know, just what happens to everybody. And all of a sudden, everybody in the van said, yeah, that happened to my uncle. And, yeah, my, my dad did that years and years ago, and we were just broke, and we didn't get blessed, and what's the deal? And all of a sudden, throughout that area, people were really starting to question that practice when it, when it was shined in the light of Scripture. And so these dramas that these, that these Quechua folks who thought they couldn't do anything, 
um, was having a great ripple effect. You know, it's the culture meets scripture idea that we heard um, Joanne Shetler and uh, Amy West talk about. So that's kind of my background um, and where I've come from. Now, uh, one of the things is we want to get these kind of programs out to a new audience. I mean, we've got a lot of content that these guys have already produced, so how do we do that? So I want to, but, but to follow on with that, I want to introduce today's theme is learning from and leveraging your people's mobile usage. Um, and, and it's really kind of um, an honor for me today and a, ter a terrifying thing to have Tommy Ahonen in the audience because really this story, my story now, starts back in 2013 in Orlando, Florida at the MMF conference. Someone had told me the year before, you really need to go to this thing, and I was busy working. I didn't have time. I was busy training folks online. But the next year, somebody said, you, you, you got to come to this thing. So in December 2013, we sat down, and this guy gets sh shined up on, the, up on the screen. His name is Tommy Ahonen, and he completely blindsided me. So here he is. He's up presenting these facts about mobile technology that I had never, ever heard before. So my entire career with Wycliffe, distribution has been the Achilles heel. You know, we could produce a fabulous drama. We could produce a fabulous video. It didn't matter, but we always had to provide the player. And we always had to maintain the player. And we always had to replace the player. The, the, the people that we were working with, they didn't have TVs, they didn't have VCRs. So whatever they produced, we'd, we'd also have to raise money and help equip them and get them out there. And when it broke, you know, get, get everything repaired. So here's this guy up on the screen saying that in just a few short years, everybody in the world would be carrying the players in their pockets. And not only that, they would have purchased them themselves for under $50. And they're going to be looking for content. Really? Okay, that was just over three years ago. So, blindsided, I started pursuing this. Is this true where I work? I, I serve in the Latin America area. Colombia, Peru, Guatemala are my principal countries, but, but uh, any Spanish-speaking country, I'm, I'm willing to go work, consult, train, whatever you need me to do. So this question, is this true where I work? Is this true in Latin America among the indigenous peoples? This took me on a journey that I want to share with you today. And so uh, the idea behind this workshop is maybe you have a similar big question that, that's just been laid on you, and you have no idea how to answer that question. So what we did was uh, we did a survey. I'd like to tell you the story today about La Voz de la Nueva Generación, uh, which in English is the voice of the new generation and the survey and how it all happened and share with you some principles behind it. Uh, it's a real catchy acronym called PEDALSA. Um, obviously, I didn't study homiletics. I didn't go to seminary. I don't know how to make a really neat uh, acronym, but these are the steps that I, I'm going to walk you through today. It's pray, define, ask, learn, share and act. And I've, and I've found it fascinating. I think God's doing something here because every presenter seems to start with the fact that when we start a project, we need to pray. So part one is learning from your people's mobile usage. So here I am. I'm reeling from Tommy's presentation. And I start telling people about this. There's this, this tsunami. And I actually use, I started my presentation off with this, pic, with this video of a tsunami just sweeping everything away in its path. And I was saying there's a seventh wave of communication, and it's called the smartphone. And it's just going to take the world by storm. And people kind of look, yeah, and that's interesting. So I started telling my boss about this. And then I said, you know what? Somebody in Latin America needs to do a survey so that they can find out if what Tommy Ahonen said is true in Latin America. No problem. So a couple of weeks later, my boss calls me up. And he says, hey, I've got funding for the survey that you wanted to do. And I said, I'm sorry. I did not say to you, Ed, I want to do a survey. I said, someone should do a survey. And he said, I've picked out that somebody, and that's you, and I want you to do it. So what do I know about surveys? 
I, I'm a communications major. I've got my communications degree from Bi Biola University in radio, TV, film. What do I remember about my survey class at Biola? Number one, don't ever believe any survey. And number two, find out who paid the, for the survey and you'll find out why it says what it says. So I said, that's what I know about surveys, boss. And he says, okay, great. Step one, pray. So I took step one and I started praying. You know, Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and you'll receive. Okay, James 1, 5 says, if you, ask, if you lack wisdom, ask God for it. God's more than happy to give it to you. And I've heard this more than once here this week too. A God-sized task is never done in our own capabilities. A God-sized task is given to us so that it can bring Him glory by doing the impossible through us. We're the stoolies, and I'm happy to be a stoolie. And I want to tell you about being a stoolie in this, in this survey because I got to watch God do some amazing things, and I just got to participate. So I prayed. And God began to put people in my path who had expertise and who were willing to help. So, one person gave me tips on how to compile the information using an online, uh, online services, or he talked to me about online services. Uh, several other people helped me with the des designing of the questions. And then another person helped, uh, helped me to find people on the ground in Mexico where we could pull the survey off because I knew nobody in Mexico but we knew we wanted to get a broad swath of, uh, of surveys done in several countries and so uh, that was the first step of the project uh, and, and through the rest of the project I followed step one which was to continue to pray step two was to define okay I now had an idea how to get the information after talking to several people but I needed to define what it was that we wanted to accomplish. So any communications major, and I've heard this here this week several times, any communications major should be, tell, should be able to tell you that there are three questions that you want to start with before tackling any project. Number one, what is my message? Number two, who is it for? And number three, how do I package my message for the audience in a way that they will want to consume it, in a way that they will want to interact with it, engage with it. So, in our case, our message is the scriptures in the minority languages. And our intended audience are people like this, those who will engage with the scriptures, but not necessarily like this gal here. This picture was taken over 10 years ago. We want to engage with the people who will interact with the scriptures on their phones. The other thing was we didn't necessarily want to survey the city kids, but we wanted to find out at the ends of the roads and walking beyond that, what about those kids? What about, how, how are those kids going to interact with the scriptures? And is it true what Tommy said, that really people at the very ends of the earth now have smartphones or have cell phones? So if you look in this, that is the village, that is a village setting in Peru that's very common. That's where people live. And the road usually, well, that's a trail right there, but the road usually goes something like that up to it. And that was our target. We also defined what our target was as far as who, do, who, did, who are the people that we want to get the information from. And that was youth between the ages of 12 years old and 24 years old. That was our target. So now we have defined our target. But we also wanted to define what is it that we want to learn from our audience. So my, my initial question was, are these youth really adopting cell phone talk technology like Tommy said they were? So we spent, so you're here. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing, but this was, I, Tommy was my motivator. My life was changed. I, I, I had been converted, right? So we had to define what we wanted to know. Then we also had to define who's going to do the survey, where are we going to do the surveys, when are we going to do the surveys, and how are we going to do the surveys. Now, looking back, I never would have gotten into this if I would have known what I was getting into. But 
Like I said, a God-sized task is only pulled off by God. And then once the surveys were completed, we needed to define how are we going to get them compiled because we're going to have them done in three countries. How are we going to compile them so that we can access the data and make any sense of it? So step number two was define. Step number three, ask. So now we had defined approximately what it, what, what it was that we wanted to know. And now it's time to go out to our intended audience and ask them so that we could measure their attitudes toward and their usage of cell phone technology to see if they really were on track with what Tommy said. If he had predicted the future com correctly, this new generation would want to read or listen to the Bible on their phones and very likely would never buy a printed paper copy of the scriptures, if Tommy was right. So, we designed a survey so that we could ask this new generation, the 12 through 24 year olds, how they're using their smartphones, or how they're using their phones at that point, what kind of content they're consuming, and what was their attitude toward number one, their language, because we're targeting my minority language speakers, number two, what's their attitude toward the Bible, and number three, What's their attitude towards smartphones? Because this is what's coming. So in our process of asking, we went and we asked help from four partner organizations. In Guatemala, we got the help of Berea Bible Institute, which is in Huehuetenango, which is a really cool word to be able to say fast. <clears throat> it's kind of in the, in, the, in the northwestern part of the country, and, and it's out in the country. And the reason why we chose them is they had seminary students who were just, just about to go on break and do their uh, practicums out in the villages, you know, where the road stops and beyond. And so we piggybacked their practicums and, and got them to take the surveys out with them to these remote areas. Then in Peru, we worked with Hauka and Ilmov. Hauka is a, is a Quechua scripture, organization, scripture promotion organization. It's the hub for five languages, and it is up in the Andes Mountains where the people are really spread out. And then with Ilmov, Ilmov was coordinating the survey, and they are an organization that promotes non-print materials in the minority languages of Peru. So, and then in, in, um, in Mexico, we got the cooperation of the Assemblies of God who had people on the ground there, and that was a miracle because I didn't know anybody in Mexico, and if Carter is here, there's Carter. Carter got me in touch with Mike Hadinger, and Mike Hadinger got me in touch with Oscar, and Oscar was a man on fire. And uh, Oscar was a Sapoteco, I think, and he just took this to heart because he really wanted to find out as well what was going on. So they agreed, and then we spent time training them in, in how we wanted the surveys conducted. So when you're asking this, how do you survey thousands of kids, 12 to 24 years old, in one week? Because we, we set the limit. We said, we want to get the survey done in one week in each country. So where do you find them? You find them in schools. So we found large groups of our target audience willing to take the survey in the schools. In the same time that it would have taken us to survey one person, we were getting between 10 and 40 surveys completed. And take a look, you know, this is, this is a rural classroom. These desks, I think, were from World War I, not World War II. And, you know, adobe walls and paper, and th this is the condition. These, these were the kids that we wanted to reach out to and find out about their attitudes and usage of cell phone technology. But before we could ask the kids, we needed to ask the school's administrator. And we had to explain to them who we were, why we were there, why we were doing the survey, and we also wanted to explain to them that this is not some secret thing. We are making the results freely available. So we showed them where they could look at the results. So we got out there. We asked 28 questions. I won't give the statistics here, but in a minute, I'll talk about, uh, I'll highlight some of the, the most significant results. We also asked for help in entering the, uh, entering the data into the online survey service. Um, it's amazing what high schoolers will do for pizza. <laughs> yeah. 
So then the numbers started coming in online, and they started to speak for themselves. Now, at the end of each survey, what we did, and I've got a bunch of them up here. Uh, we have some extras. We printed up these neat little business cards that look like a cell phone. The back says, thank you for participating in the survey. The front has a bunch of links. The first link was the results to the survey, and that was the first thing that we gave to the administrator. said, this is where you can see what we're doing. The rest of the links were all links to scripture-related resources in their languages. And I'll tell you in a little bit more about this. But the first thing the kids did, they, they got the surveys collected, the surveyors handed out the cards, and they went like this. No? A little cell phone. So, step four, learn. What did we learn? Okay, first of all, we learned that these cards were a huge hit. They got us into schools because the, the, the administrators could see that we were legit. They, they got the kids to these websites. Now, I, I tried to contact other webmasters, but when I talked to Bill... Um, I know, I know too many bills. It'll come to me here in a minute. But when I talked to Bill at Scripture Earth, I said, Bill Dick, thank you. I said, Bill, can you look at the results in, in um, Peru of, at Scripture Earth, visitors from your site, visitors at your site from Peru uh, in the months of June, July, August, September, and October? So he goes in and he goes, June, July, August? Whoa. And then... So he said, basically, they were June, July, August, September, and October. The kids went to the website based on these cards. It was, it was flat. It was only once. They only went once, but they did go there. So just a point learned was that if you want to get this new generation to visit your site, your Facebook page, something, print up some attractive cards for cheap and figure out a way to get them into their hands. It, they're only going to go there once unless you've got something that keeps them coming back. But this really worked. And if you want, please feel free. I have extras. Just take them, use them. I will say the top link is broken, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. The rest of the links still work. So now we had sitting on our laps 21,037 surveys that were completed. We got 4,525 done in Guatemala. We got 7,299 done in Peru. And we got 9,213 done in Mexico. And like I said, Oscar in Mexico was a man on fire. What did we learn? We learned that minority languages are alive and well. In Guatemala, 37% of those surveyed speak a minority language. In Mexico, it was 40%. And in Peru, 75% of those surveyed speak a minority language. That's important to us as SIL. Number two, church is part of their lives. We asked if they attended church. One of the questions was, do you attend church, either Catholic or Protestant? Yes or no? In Guatemala, we had 88%. Mexico, that was 55%. And Peru, 78% of those surveyed attend church. Now, this is an interesting one. We asked, do you want to hear a Bible story on your phone? These kids are interested in the Bible. 91% in Guatemala wanted to hear a Bible story. 57 in Mexico, and 90% in Peru wanted to hear a Bible story. These are very religious countries. And I'll show one more thing. Do you want to read the Bible on your phone? Okay. The numbers are almost the same. Those who attend church and those who want to read the Bible on their phone, they're very similar here. But what I thought was impressive coming from North America was the fact that you had numbers in the high percentages. When I asked people to guess how many, how many kids wanted to hear a Bible story, how many kids want to read the Bible on their phone, people say, I don't know, 50%, 60%. I mean, this, this blew us away. Now, when I talk to pastors, and they say, we don't know how to get involved. They say, you got to do something on your phone. They, they say, we don't know how to get involved. They say, well, why don't you start with recording some Bible stories? Because you have a willing and ready audience who will accept that. We asked the question, we wanted attitudes. Is it necessary to have a smartphone? Is it necessary? Guatemala and Peru, 
in the 80%, Mexico in 67%, which is very interesting because I'll show you another statistic in just a minute. So yes, they are adopting the technology and they believe that it's important. They use social media. Facebook was king. Now, granted, look, this is August 2015 when we compiled these, right? 31% had Facebook accounts, 36 in Peru. Uh, Google Plus was a surprise. Now, I think that number's probably dropped since then. And WhatsApp, no one had heard of WhatsApp, or at least I hadn't, until I went down to work on the survey and everyone was telling me, oh, you gotta install WhatsApp on your phone because I wanna keep in touch. I'm like, what is WhatsApp? Right, that was two years ago. It's the only way I can communicate with some of my colleagues now because they don't answer email, they don't answer Skype, and I'm an old guy. They're the new digital, uh, you know, they're digital natives. They, they are all about WhatsApp. Okay, top three uses of their phones. This one, I guess I shouldn't have been shocked, but I was stunned. Number one in all three countries, and by a margin, was music. They're not buying a phone to make phone calls to their grandmother. They're buying a phone to listen to music. So, what's something that a church might be able to do to get some content onto people's phones? Do you have any ideas maybe from this, from this data? This is what I say to pastors, okay? Get your kids together and start recording some music, okay? The second, you know, I, this was an interesting one. For people who are always chronically not on time, they, they were using their alarm as number two. <laughs> oh, I needed to have been at church half an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. And I'm certain that these numbers, you know, these numbers down here have probably changed and WhatsApp is probably in number two in all of this. But as I say, this was two years ago when we, when we did this. Can I interrupt you just for a moment? You may. Yes, yes, because this is the new generation. This is, these are our new, this, this is the people who are going to be using the phone for a long time. Okay, type of phones that were owned two years ago. Okay, this shocked me. Two years ago, these kids, 60% in Guatemala, 64% in Mexico, already had smartphones. In Peru, only 25% had smartphones. My hunch is that those who had no phone two years ago jumped over the feature phone category and went right to the smartphone. Because in Peru, today, I can walk into Wong and I can buy a full-featured touchscreen smartphone for $40 or $30, right? So those kids, I'm sure, now have just jumped straight to smartphones. I taught a course in Guatemala in February. Um, all nine of the students had smartphones, Three of them had bought their first phone in the last three months, and they were all smartphones. They're not going to dumb phones. Okay, something else that we learned in this whole process, okay? Um, we learned some lessons about survey design. We made some mistakes. We had to throw away over 1,000 surveys be because of invalid data. The first question that we asked to keep ourselves out of any trouble, and this helped us get into the schools, was... Are you taking, I am taking this survey of my own free will, yes or no? We had a bunch of kids mark no. So what do you do with those surveys? <laughs> you throw them away. So, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry that we had to throw these surveys away, but if you were being forced to take this survey, I don't want your data, right? Who knows what they would have said on the, in the survey. Second of all, we had something where we said, choose your three uh, your top three usages of your phone. How many is three? Is it this many? Is it this many? No. But some people didn't know how many three was, and so we had to throw all those away too because they marked more than three. Um, the other thing, we tried in the survey to not have any fill-in-the-boxes because can you imagine the data entry on 21,000 surveys of fill-in-the-boxes? The only box that we had them fill in was the location where they took the survey. And we tried to ask some questions about their, their attitude toward their language and their awareness of, of resources in their language. We said, did you know that the Bible is available in your language? 
Well, we had a lot of monolingual Spanish speakers. Oh. So we had to <laughs> throw out those questions that related to that. The other thing that we learned was we learned some lessons about online survey companies. Um, the free surveys two years ago had a 10-question limit. Now, I just did a search today. That's changed. There's some, you know, but you get what you pay for the, is the bottom line. And when you don't pay anything, you don't really get anything. Um, so, so we ended up going with a paid service. Number two, when your paid service decides to upgrade their system a month after you've finished all their surveys, and you have handed out cards that have a link on them, a tiny URL, and they give you a new URL for all your results, it doesn't matter how many times you scream at them, even in Hindi, they're not going to give you your old links back. So that wasn't a good thing. So you might want to ask if you're going to do a survey, are, do you have any plans in upgrading your servers in the next six months? And if they say yes, find somebody else. The other interesting thing was once you, do, once you let your subscription lapse, your data is gone. So if you are going to use a paid subscription survey, survey service and you know that your subscription is going to end, download your data before the date that it ends. Fortunately, um, I had everything backed up. So learning from your people's mobile usage. Pray, define, learn, ask, and learn. So I want to talk about part two, leveraging your people's mobile usage. Once we had the highlights or the results in and digested them, there were two things left to do, share and act. So share. If you find something good, what do you do with it? You share it. Uh, one of the first things I did is I went back to Peru and I went back to Guatemala and I sat down with, in this case, this is, this is the president of the, of the seminary in Guatemala and his right-hand man, and I went through all the survey results, page by page by page by page. And when I finished, it was silent for about a full minute. They just sat there. And um, the, the, the president, Adolfo, looked up, and he had been telling me, he's, he's uh, 67 years old, and he's, he's planning to retire. And he looked up at uh, Salatiel, and he says, I think we're going to have to change the way that we're training our students because we need to get into the 21st century. That was, that was to me, that was very encouraging. Okay, I'm sharing today. I'm sharing this freely. Here's the link. Go to this page. Uh, I should have gotten a tiny URL, shouldn't I? <laughs> and I'm the webmaster, so I, I, I know the link wouldn't have gotten broken. But go to this page. We have the survey results there. Uh, we have a, a write-up about it. Uh, and so, if, so we're, we want to share. We want to get the word out. You know, if this is helpful to your organization, please use it. Um, I'm also happy to share what I've learned. Um, I've got my contact info at the end. If you're planning on doing something like this, I am I'm not an expert. You probably don't want to call me, but what you want to do is call me and just ask for what we learned, and I'd be more than happy to give you more detail uh, about what we did learn in this whole thing. So the second step, or step six in this whole thing, is act. All of this information is great, but if we don't act on it, it's just another academic activity that ends up on the shelf. So after writing up the results of the survey, I also wrote a, pa a paper called What Now? And it gives some concrete suggestions of steps that anybody can take to leverage this information for God's kingdom work. Uh, it can be found on the exact same webpage, that link that I just gave you. And that report and the follow-up report are available in both Spanish and English. Uh, so please, use it. The other thing I'm doing to act on all of this knowledge is I came to EMDC Two years ago, we were just about to do the survey, and I heard about Scripture App Builder. And as soon as I was able to download a copy, I started learning it. I, I got in touch with Richard, started working on the Spanish translation, and then I got people who actually spoke Spanish to uh, read my translation and fix it. And I have begun teaching Scripture App Builder everywhere and anywhere I can in Latin America. And in the process of doing that, I've been training other people how to teach the course as well so that we can get out there 
and get as many apps made in the minority languages as possible. I have a hunch that people will install anything on their phones right now that's in their language, anything. But six years from now, I don't think that they're going to install just anything on their phone just because it's in their language. So we want to be the ones who are producing the first apps and the best apps that people will continue to use over the years. Also, find out what your, in your audience wants to engage with. Now, at the beginning of this, I said, we've done all these audio dramas and radio programs, and, and you, know, you can run them on the air for a while, but you still have to pay for that. So now we're working on, I'm working with these guys who have done these dramas, who have done radio programs, and we're repackaging all that content now as apps with interfaces so that they can listen to it over and over and over. So, Padalsa. Pray, define, ask, learn, share, and act. Now, I know it's not a catchy name. It doesn't make a good meme. Um, but for tackling a big project that you don't know how to pull off, it works. So, I'm open for any questions now. Here's my contact info. You can Skype me. You can WhatsApp me. You can call me. And you can even come and breathe the same air with me because that's where communication still takes place. Any questions? Yes. I can repeat your question. There's a mic on right here? Oh, this thing right here. Okay. And I th is, I'm not sure if it's on. I think I just turned it on, so go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the question is um, looking at what you uh, had put up about Scripture App Builder, you know, wanting to get that out. Um, the thing with first to market is if you don't follow up and continue to stay ahead, then you end up like the Nokia graph. Right. And so I guess the question is, is what is your strategy for after the release of Scripture App Builder? How do you keep it? out there and in front. Okay, so, I, so I'm hearing two questions in that. Number one is, um, how, yeah, how do we keep, keep equipping people for more, or for, to do more besides just Scripture App Builder? Um, in particular, the young man that I'm working with in Peru, Carlos, he's already exploring Java. He's learning Java. He's, he's taking some courses on programming. And I'm, I'm kind of a starter, and this kid is a finisher. So he's already teaching himself how to do Java programming, and, I'm, and he's going to get a community of programmers around him who are going to be able to build apps that Scripture App Builder can't build. So that's one of the things that I'm encouraging. I'm a mentor. I'm a coach. I'm, a, I'm, a guy, I'm the guy with the sharp stick behind you that keeps poking. Um, a lot of my students know that I'll just call them out of the blue and say, okay, what are you doing now? I'd like to hear. Um, the other question that I heard you say is, how do we get those out to market and get people to continually engage with them? So in the Scripture App Builder course in Spanish, we formed a user group. We, formed, we have a, a page for Scripture App Builder in Spanish. We're posting tutorials. One gal a week and a half ago posted a note that they had just come out with the Pentateuch app in Iche, I think, was the, is the name of her language. And the Pentateuch app has the first five books of the Bible in text. It also has it in audio, and it's synchronized to highlight the audio as they listen to it. The first three or four comments on the page were, wow, that's really neat. And the next comment was, where do I get it? And the next comment was, I want it too. And the next comment was, can you Bluetooth it to me? And the next comment was, can I swing by the office and have you, what, or have you uh, share it to me? Et cetera, et cetera. And so... By creating Facebook and, and encouraging our students to keep out there, when they do apps, keep out there on Facebook and, and let their community know. Um, we're also working at how to set up Google Play Store accounts. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's kind of uh, like that presentation. Let Just do something, and once you get in motion, we'll figure the rest of it out. And that's kind of where we're at today. Another question. Did you evaluate Google Forms for the survey, and why or why not did you use it? Um, number one, I didn't evaluate Google Forms for the survey uh, because, number two, I'm not really a Google person. And 
we needed to be able to kind of look at the data from, from several different ways, and I wasn't sure, and I had a limited amount of time. It is, it is free, and it dumps into a spreadsheet, so you, so, can, yeah, you if, can use it. And I'm sure that you can find out how to use it on YouTube. I just didn't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I work with a radio station part-time, and I was recently asked um, by someone if we could do a radio program, put it on Facebook, so that they would see it on the radio, and then they could, people could get out, the, get out what was played again on Facebook at some future time. And as we've been talking about this, we've been thinking Facebook is probably a place for them to get at the, the information. Probably be better to have maybe a website that we would actually make a repository of past programs yeah. and then make a phone app that they could actually somehow navigate and access to where they want to go. We're thinking Facebook could then be the thing that people see constantly that reminds them to go listen to the program on the station or they can go look at the repository to get at the information about this particular program. Yeah. Is that what you've already done? Um, no, we're not that far advanced, but okay. I'll take your suggestion and I'll use it. And okay. Google Play Store is the other... The other Maybe um, we can talk and figure out. Yeah, I'd like to see what you've already done so I don't so. reinvent the wheel. Yep. And we're out of time for questions, but so grab me at the breaks or whatever and let's talk. Thank you. Yeah.